We have to find the metric giving the distance between two elements in a set and the norm giving the length of one element. Now we will define another topological structure, the inner product between two elements. And this gives us the concept of an angle. The definition says that a real valued function taking two elements x and y as inputs is an inner product on the set capital X if and only if the following four conditions are satisfied for all elements X, Y and Z in this set. First, additivity. The inner product of the sum X plus Y with the element Z is the same as the sum of the inner product between X and Z and the inner product between Y and Z. Then the function needs to have a homogeneity property, meaning that if we multiply the first element by an arbitrary scalar alpha, then the resulting inner product is identical to the inner product of the original elements, x and y, but scaled by the same scalar. The function also needs to have the symmetry property that the inner product between x and y is the complex conjugate of the inner product between y and x. And finally, the inner product of an element with itself is strictly positive, as long as it is not the zero element. In the latter case, the inner product would be zero. The inner product is a stronger topological structure than the norm and the metric, because if a set has an inner product, then this inner product also gives the set a norm which again induces a metric, as we have seen earlier. We find this induced norm by taking the inner product of the element with itself, and then we take the square root of this. For this induced norm, we have the well-known inequality called Schwartz inequality, or Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. It says that the absolute value of the inner product between two elements, x and y, is less than or equal to the norm of x times the norm of y. And note that this inequality only holds for the norm that is induced by the inner product. So what is this norm? And first of all, what is the inner product of the sets that we are particularly interested in? Let us first consider the set of n-dimensional vectors. The inner product between two vectors x and y is defined as x transposed times y, which you know well. This is defined as the sum of all the vector elements multiplied together. We find the norm that the inner product induces by using the definition. On the previous page, we learned that the induced norm of x is found by first taking the inner product of x with itself and then taking the square root. And when we use the definition of the inner product, then we see that what we get is the Euclidean norm, the 2 norm. So the Schwartz inequality, which gives us a relationship between the inner product between two elements x and y and their norms, only holds for the Euclidean norm. Let us illustrate this in the two-dimensional case. Consider two elements in R2, and let us call these x, which has two elements x1 and x2, and y, which has elements y1 and y2. You may remember that we have this relationship for two-dimensional vectors, the inner product between two two-dimensional vectors x and y equals the Euclidean norm of x times the Euclidean norm of y times cosine of theta, where theta is the angle from the vector x to the vector y. This illustrates why we say that the inner product gives us the concept of an angle. Also, since the absolute value of cosine of theta always is smaller than or equal to 1, we see that this inequality agrees with Schwartz inequality. In particular, if we take the absolute value on both sides, like this, and since the norms are positive by definition, the absolute value of the right-hand side is given by the norms times the absolute value of cosine theta.
this we know is always less than or equal to 1. In other words, the absolute value of the inner product between x and y is less than or equal to the norm of x times the norm of y, which is exactly the same as Schwarz inequality says. The inner product between two continuous real-valued functions f and g is defined as the integral from a to b, which is the interval on which the functions are defined, of the two functions multiplied together. And using the definition of the induced norm, inserting the definition of the inner product, we see that the induced norm is the L2 norm. In addition to Schwartz inequality, I will present one more inequality that comes in handy when we want to find the relationship between the absolute value of vector elements, xi and yi, and the norms of the corresponding vectors, x and y. This is Hölder's inequality, and for n-dimensional vectors, it states that when we take the absolute value of the product of the vector elements, and we sum this up, then the resulting sum is less than or equal to the p norm of x times the q norm of y when p and q satisfies this equality here. We see that if p and q both are equal to 2, then this equality holds. And then Hölder's inequality implies Schwartz inequality. We can also see that Hölder's inequality holds for the 1 and infinity norms. Hölder's inequality also holds for continuous real-valued functions.